Hey everyone, I'm Allison Mars. You are watching NBC News Now. Here is what's happening. Americans across the country reacting to the CDC's new mask guidance. You do not need to wear one if you're fully vaccinated. I think it's about time. That's really awesome. I'm gonna keep my mask. Why? Just a precaution. On Capitol Hill, infrastructure negotiations, Senate Republicans working on an offer for the president. And tax day is Monday. Get them in on time to avoid penalties. But are you paying more anyway because of your race? There's nothing in the code that says black married couples pay more. It's just how the code operates. We start with the latest mask guidance from the CDC and what Americans think of it today. NBC News political correspondent Ali Vitale is in D.C. NBC News correspondent Gabe Gutierrez is in Queens, New York. And NBC News Now correspondent Maura Barrett is in Chicago. Ali, we will kick it off with you. Today, the African American History Museum opened its doors for the first time this year. The first lady among the first guests. You were there. You got in a question for Dr. Biden. What did she say to you about the new mask guidance? Yeah. Well, Allison, she brought cookies for staff here on their first day of reopening after the pandemic. And she had a lot of kind words for bringing arts and culture back to D.C., both D.C.'s residents and the tourists who might start to flock here now that more people are getting vaccinated. Listen to what she told me exclusively outside the museum. We're opening up culture and beauty coming back to D.C. What's your reaction to the new mask guidance from the CDC? Isn't it great? Don't you feel good without it? Now, Allison, some folks echoed what Dr. Biden said there, that they feel great about these new mask guidelines, especially as it relates to not wearing a mask outside if they're fully vaccinated. That being said, I did talk to some people who said, OK, I feel comfortable outside. But when it comes to inside, even though they're fully vaccinated, they said that they might prefer to continue wearing their mask, whether it's because they're habituated to wearing it after the last year or because they just want to take an extra precaution, either because they don't know if the people around them are vaccinated or because they just want to make sure that they keep themselves safe. I think it's a really good reminder, Allison, as we're all walking around trying to acclimate this new version of normal, that you can't just flip a switch yeah. and issue new guidance and expect everyone right. to get on board immediately. People need some time to adjust. That's definitely the message I've been getting out here on the National Mall as I've been talking to folks. Yeah, Ellie, you're hearing a lot of the same thing from folks that they're just not sure, even if their reasons may be different. Uh, what is D.C. doing about this new guidance? Are they making changes? Well, Allison, that's why it's guidance. It's not a hard and fast policy. And states and localities right. do have to play catch up here. I want to show you a tweet from Mayor Bowser, the D.C. mayor, yesterday, in which she said that D.C., consistent with past practice, is immediately reviewing the CDC guidance and will update D.C. health guidance accordingly. Even just consider, Allison, that here at the museum today, folks who were waiting out in line outside to get in, they didn't have to wear a mask. But as soon as they went inside because of Smithsonian rules, as well as because of D.C. rules, they had to put their masks back on. Now, that could change as soon as D.C. decides to change its mask mandate rules. But for now, this is the reality of what it is. I will say, though, it didn't put a damper on any of the excitement here. I was talking to the museum's director. He was hired during the pandemic. This is actually his first day of being allowed to be in the museum with actual people seeing all of the powerful exhibits in there. It was a really exciting day for oh. him and a lot of the staff that we saw, that we talked to. Oh, no doubt. I mean, Ali, that's what it's all about, right? Uh, people actually being able to be yeah. there and enjoy it. That's a great day. Gabe, you're in Corona, Queens, which not only shares the virus's name, but was also hit so hard by it. Uh, what's the reaction there? Uh, hey there, Allison. Well, as you can see behind me, there are actually a lot of people here at this street market, a lot of street vendors. And we have been seeing still wearing, we've seen people still wearing their masks. Um, there is a, a lot of relief here, but also a lot of skepticism, a lot of caution. Actually, right here is a uh, mobile vaccination clinic where people are signed up to get their vaccine. Walk-ins welcome, no appointments necessary. And this community actually has about 28% of its population in the zip code, only about 28% that have been fully vaccinated. And we spoke with a local doctor here who's actually caught off guard, very surprised by the updated CDC guidance. And he also had some concerns. Take a listen. 
I was very surprised. I was I was very taken aback, and I am. I understand where the CDC is coming from. We know that the vaccines work, but at the same time, we're not there yet. We don't have the herd immunity. We don't have the community immunity that we quite need. We're not there yet. So yeah, that was one of uh, several people we spoke to today that for them, it does seem as a bit of a shock, Allison. Now this community, again, about 28% of its population in this zip code is vaccinated, but it was devastated just so much uh, be, by this pandemic for more than a year. You know, these street vendors have popped up, but many of them have been so financially devastated and they say it's gonna take them a long time to cover, to recover. Still, there is some sense of relief here, Allison. Mm -hmm. Gabe, as Ali pointed out, this is just guidance, right? Uh, so the states and, and the cities, it's up to them to figure out what they want to do here. So how about Mayor de Blasio or Governor Cuomo in New York? What are they doing uh, about this new mass guidance so far? Yeah, they... A similar situation here in, in New York, as well, New York State, as well as New York City. Both Mayor de Blasio and Governor Cuomo say that they will review the guidelines here um, because masks will still be important for uh, schools, for public transportation. We're right by a subway line here, many people commuting uh, to and from work. So they have not dropped all the mask requirements uh, indoors here in New York, as some other states have. But it's something you're taking a look at right now, Allison. All right, let's go to Maura, who's over in Chicago. Uh, Maura, what do folks think there uh, about the new mass guidance? Are they into it? Are they unsure? What are you hearing? Allison, we spent the day in Old Town in Chicago. We're along Wells Street where there's a ton of bars and restaurants, and it's a rare, beautiful spring day here in Chicago. People really eager to get outside. It's been a busy day. And it's a, it's a mixed bag of what we see on the street, whether people are still wearing their masks or just along their chins uh, or no masks at all. And the, the key thing to point out here is that here in Chicago, nearly 45 percent of people are fully vaccinated. So when you see that half and half rea mixed reaction of people still wearing their masks or not, they often and point to the fact that they're still not fully vaccinated. I want you to hear from some of our conversations that we had today when we asked about people's reactions. So honestly, I think it's just more of like a personal opinion. I do understand that people are still at risk and I think people should be respectful of that as well. Um, but at the end of the day, it's a decision per person. And I know that I will continue to wear masks when necessary, but outside, I mean, probably not. Uh, I got my second shot about a week ago. Uh, I'm, all, I'm all good, uh, but I'm still a little bit nervous to be out in the public. I still have my, my, my mask on, otherwise uh, it's mask off, you know, during uh, when you walk on, on the street. Um, yeah, so I feel pretty good about it. Very happy about no more masks. I think it's about time I'm fully vaccinated, so yeah. let's go for it. Yeah. And everybody enjoy. Definitely an overall our overarching feeling of excitement here in Chicago. Remember, they never fully reopened businesses even last summer because of the abundance of caution. The mayor now saying that by July they want we want Chicago to be fully reopened. People really looking forward to that. And this was a surprise added step to, to getting there, Allison. All right, so more I have to ask you the same question. What are the city's plans about its mask guidance? Uh, any updates to it yet? Not exactly. The city of Chicago did say that they support the CDC's guidance. I want to read you some of their statement that they put out about this. They said, though, that this does not mean that masks are going away. We agree with the CDC that masks should be worn during travel, including use of public transit, and that the unvaccinated should continue to wear masks in most settings. The Illinois governor also saying he plans on assessing and, and re, uh, reassessing the executive order. He hasn't changed that uh, as of right now. But when when it comes to guidance for specific businesses, there's a lot of independently owned bars and restaurants on the street, as well as corporate businesses like Walgreens, Starbucks. And as you walk down the street, they all still have their mask mandate signs up. I spoke with one restaurant owner here, the sushi bar, just here, and she told me why she's planning on keeping these capacity limits and mask mandates in place. All right, Maura, Gabe, Ali, thanks to the three of you for giving a sense of how people across the country are feeling about this new mass guidance. Uh, great weekend to all three of you.
The new mask guidance from the CDC, a little bit confusing. Do you wear a mask? Do you still bring a mask with you just in case you need a mask? What should vaccinated people do? Here to help us figure it all out, Dr. Richard Besser. He is the former acting CDC director and president and CEO of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, which was started by one of the founders of Johnson & Johnson. Oh, Dr. Besser, I'm always happy to see you, but really happy to see you on a day like this when we have so many questions. The CDC is saying that vaccinated people can take their masks off in most cases, uh, but not all states, towns and businesses are making that adjustment just yet. Uh, so what advice do you have for fully vaccinated people who just don't know what to do here? Yeah, you know, Allison, it, it's always nice talking to you on a Friday. This is a momentous day. The, <laughs> I, I really feel that we're turning a corner uh, in terms of how we're responding to this pandemic. Uh, but there is a lot of confusion. There are a lot of questions. And, you know, for so long, we've been traumatized by this pandemic and we've we've gotten security from our masks, whether it's a single mask or a double mask. It, it's it's given us that sense of protection. And now we're being told that if you're fully vaccinated, you can put that away. It's going to take a lot of people some time to come to grips with that. And we have to recognize that and support people if they still want to wear their masks. But also uh, I understand that, that, that governors, that state and local officials are going to make their own decisions based on what's happening in, the, in their localities. And we will see a lot of variety across the country. Dr. Besser, what about vaccinated parents who have unvaccinated kids at home? Uh, you're a pediatrician. Should parents be concerned about bringing COVID home with them or exposing their kids if they're fully vaccinated and they go out without a mask themselves? No, I don't think so. This is one of those things where okay. the, the data are pretty strong. If you're fully vaccinated, mm -hmm. um, even if you 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 become infected, um, the chances of you spreading this to someone else are very, very low. They're not zero. And so if you can't deal with a non-zero level of risk, um, you can continue to wear your mask. The CDC is not saying to people, don't wear a mask. You can't wear a mask. So if, right. if your level of comfort is such that you want to wear a mask, keep keep doing so. The, the, the piece of this that's really important to remember, and it gives me a lot of hope as a pediatrician, mm -hmm. is that the younger kids mm -hmm. are, the less likely they are to have severe disease, the mm -hmm. less likely, thankfully, they are to, to be hospitalized or to die from this. And so, you know, the fact that we've now got vaccines down to age 12 gives me a lot of comfort. Kids younger than that tend to do very mm -hmm. well if they get infected. But parents who are fully vaccinated are not a real threat to their children. That's not something I think parents need to worry about. Great to know. Uh, important stuff as well, uh, Dr. Besser, for parents who are worried. All right, I have to ask you about some breakthrough cases that are making headlines. I think you know I'm a pretty big baseball fan. Uh, the New York Yankees say eight of their fully vaccinated team members have tested positive for COVID, including shortstop Glaber Torres. Uh, the team says all eight got the J&J &J vaccine. Uh, Torres already had COVID back in December. Uh, the Yankees GM Brian Cashman says the team is dealing with a pretty aggressive variant. Uh, so, Dr. Besser, I have to ask, what's going on here? Uh, is this a J&J &J issue or something else? Uh, we, we've kind of had this understanding that breakthrough cases are rare, but that's a, that's a whole lot of guys in the Yankees. Yeah, so so here's, here's the important thing to recognize with this. We mm -hmm. vaccinate not to prevent all infection. We vaccinate to prevent serious infection, hospitalization, and death. And so, you know, when you have a program in place that is testing people, regardless of whether they have symptoms, you are going to find some people who get mm -hmm. infected. And thankfully, uh, we're not hearing from the Yankees that people were sick or people uh, people were required medical care. Right. So this this supports the idea that vaccines are effective. Uh, you know, Bill Maher, the, the comedian as well, tested positive but had no, no symptoms. Yep. He was in a setting where there was a testing program in place. So we're going to have to get used to that piece of it. And remember that the reason okay. for vaccination, when we talk about vaccines being 95 percent effective, they're 95 percent effective against hospitalization and death in their, uh, and, and other forms of serious infection, not against okay. all infection, uh, uh, you know, g getting that virus okay. at all.
You bring up Bill Maher, and I wanted to ask you a question about him. He canceled the show tonight. He says he's tested positive, even though he's fully vaccinated. He tweeted, uh, thanks to all wishing me to get well. Hard to do since I feel perfectly fine, but I appreciate it. Uh, Dr. Besser, uh, Maher is asymptomatic, as are several of the Yankees. If you are vaccinated, you test positive for COVID, and you don't have symptoms, do you need to be worried about spreading the virus to others, especially if they're unvaccinated? You really don't. You know, when, when Dr. Walensky was talking about the pieces of evidence that led the CDC to mm -hmm. make the decision and, and the recommendation uh, that you don't need to wear masks if you're fully vaccinated, they said that there's finally enough evidence that they're comfortable that people who've been fully vaccinated, if they get infected, are going to have very low levels of virus and are very unlikely to spread okay. to other people. Now, if, if you're in a setting where you're okay. living with someone who's at, at high risk for serious disease, um, you're going to want to wear a mask in, the, in, mm -hmm. in, in that setting. So you, you want to not generalize to everybody. And if you have special medical right. conditions, you should really talk to your doctor mm -hmm. before you decide to, mm -hmm. to put your mask away. Dr. Besser, a Delta announced today that it will be requiring all of its new hires uh, get vaccinated. Current workers will not be forced to get the vaccine, but they might not be able to work on international flights if they don't get the COVID shot. Do you think that's a good approach? Uh, and what should passengers uh, know here uh, when they're flying? Well, it's, you know, this just points to to really what all businesses are struggling with. You know, so many people have been working remote, yeah. not the airline industry, because you can't. But the question is, do you require that all of your employees who come in are fully vaccinated? Uh, if not, how do you ensure the safety of others in the in, in the workplace? Uh, I think that that it is within the the uh, uh, realm of reason for an airline to say, look, if if you're going to be working on our planes, we're going to require that you're vaccinated because you know there's a chance that we have high risk people on these airplanes who who if they get COVID uh, may not do well with that, and we want our customers who come on the airline uh, to feel comfortable that. Any anyone who's coming in contact with them has been fully vaccinated. Dr. Besser, I said it before, I'll say it again. It is so wonderful to have you on a day like this. I think we all went sort of like, yay, and then wait a second and had so many questions. So you, you always have the answers and great guidance. We really appreciate it. Well, just one more thing before we go. And, and, and I just want to, yes. it's, it's a point that I hit a lot. While, while if you're fully vaccinated, the, the word is you can take your masks off. We have to recognize that, that across America, there are a lot of people who haven't had really good access to vaccination, in particular Black and Latino right. Americans. And Absolutely. so we need states and localities to continue to step up the efforts to make it as easy as possible, especially now as there's more incentive. We want people to know it's as easy as possible. Yes. You can walk in. You don't need appointments to get your, your shot. Um, let's make sure that everyone has access to vaccine. Let's get everyone vaccinated so we can all lose the masks. Uh, Dr. Besser, thank you. Thanks. Have a good weekend. You too. Some schools are set to reopen for in-person learning in the fall, but air quality, poor air quality, becoming a major concern. Many schools are now pouring millions of federal dollars into electronic air cleaning devices that experts are saying might actually do more harm than good. NBC News correspondent Heidi Presbella joins me now with exclusive reporting on how the Department of Education is stepping in. Heidi, we'll get to the Department of Ed in a minute, but tell us about these air filters, these air system devices. What's going on with them? Yeah, hi, Allison. We're speaking with a number of experts in this field, in the field of indoor mm -hmm. air quality, who penned an open letter saying that they're very concerned that these schools are basically making uninformed decisions with billions of dollars in COVID money that's now flowing to these schools that are under pressure to open purchasing these devices, which are really scientifically unproven to either address COVID and that they could be potentially harmful. Listen to what one of these experts had to tell us. School districts were faced with uh, uh, a huge amount of pressure. Uh, I, and I believe they basically did a mistake, uh, but not a, an intended mistake. But the, the pressure now is to reconsider this decision, is to reconsider looking at the data from manufacturers. 
what I found is that many school districts will say, you know, we pay the consultant or we looked into it. But then when we look at the company itself, we found that the company did not actually uh, do a test for the airborne removal of COVID or the company did not uh, have data about um, basically byproducts or the harm of the device. So, Ms. Satari, there also told me that a lot of the studies that do exist are manufacturer-funded studies. And in the meantime, Allison, we're trying to get a grasp on just how many of these, uh, these schools have installed these devices, but it believes it is believed to be in the millions of dollars worth. Heidi, you spoke to a parent in Virginia who was so concerned about the air quality that he decided to run for his kid's school board. What did he tell you, and, and what are you hearing from other parents? Yeah, he said, look, it's going to be really hard for schools to walk this back because they were very well intentioned and they weren't really given the information up front by the federal government. When Congress put this money out there, they didn't say the magic words. You have to use this on proven technology like HEPA filters or UV irradiation. We talked with him the other day. Take a listen. The way I look at it is at best, these devices are unproven. And at worst, they're potentially dangerous. And so, uh, you know, so obviously, like, you know, we tell kids, you know, to follow the science. And so I would hope that our elected officials and our school board members would follow the science and, um, you know, look for, um, you know, there, there are solutions that are available that are that are cheaper and more effective and proven. So again, what these parents are asking for is that the schools just shut off these devices until there is more studies telling us about what exactly is happening when they put some of these chemicals or ozone into the air, because ozone, Allison, can be very reactive. And among the chemicals that Ms. Satari mentioned was formaldehyde production. Again, differences among products, differences among manufacturers, but overall, yeah. there's just not the science there yet. Heidi, you have some exclusive reporting on how the Department of Education plans to address uh, the air quality issue in schools. Uh, what have you learned? Yeah, Allison, the Secretary of Education did speak with us exclusively and said that he is linking arms with the CDC and with the Department of Health and Human Services to try and address this issue. So we should expect some guidelines, uh, more guidelines later this month. But here's the problem. The Department of Education can't really recommend one product over another, even though we know HEPA filters, UV irradiators, those are the proven products. So all they can do at this point is really offer guidelines. And again, these products are being hard sold to a lot of schools that are desperate to find solutions to clean the air as they welcome back students, many of whom are not going to be vaccinated potentially by the time, especially the younger ones, they go back to school. Heidi, more great reporting on the concerns about kids going back to school, particularly when it comes to the air that they're breathing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Let's go to NBC News Now correspondent Simone Boyce. She has the latest headlines from NBCNews.com, and they are the Friday edition, which, as you know, are our favorite. Simone. These weeks are flying by, Alice, and I can't believe it's already the Friday edition again. And we're going to kick things off today with some news from Delta, the company announcing it will require all new hires to be vaccinated. This makes Delta one of the first major corporations to implement a vaccine mandate. Now, current Delta employees will be exempt from the policy. However, they may face some restrictions, like not being able to work on international flights. And in Oklahoma, two contractors have died in an explosion at Kerr Dam. A spokesman for the Grand River Dam Authority saying their bodies were recovered this morning. Now, a third contractor was with them when it happened Thursday night, but was able to get out. The Dam Authority does not yet know the cause, but says there may have been a pocket of natural methane gas where workers were drilling. And in India, 18 wild Asiatic elephants were found dead in a forest reserve. Officials saying the sudden deaths may have been caused by a massive lightning strike, pointing to evidence of burnt trees in the area. But examiners are waiting for a forensic test to see if there are any other possible reasons. And a Florida judge ruling two deputies who were fired for their inaction during the 2018 Parkland mass shooting at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School will be getting their jobs back with back pay and other benefits. An arbitrator has not yet ruled on the case of a third fired deputy. 
and a cat in Chicago using one of its nine lives. Take a look at this. The cat jumping out of a fifth floor window from a burning apartment and surviving. There, there you have it, folks. The Chicago Fire Department caught it all on video. The cat just missed a wall as it came down and somehow landed on all four paws on a bed of grass. See, Allison, this is why I do not trust cats. Oh, my cats. gosh. Uh, Simone, I saw that cat going out the window. I'm like, after the dead elephants, we can't show a dead cat. Oh, my God. Oh, my gosh. We didn't show a dead cat. Does it live? <laughs> wow. <laughs> Close one. <laughs> Thanks, Simone. Israel sending ground troops to the Gaza border as it launches more aerial attacks. At least 126 Palestinians and eight Israelis have died in the five days of fighting, including in the West Bank today. 31 of them Palestinian children, one an Israeli child. NBC News global correspondent Raf Sanchez has the latest. Allison, that operation the Israeli military launched last night was the most intense assault on Gaza we have seen yet. Artillery, tanks, aircraft all brought to bear to attack a Hamas tunnel network. That's according to the Israeli military. But those Israeli ground forces did not actually enter the Gaza Strip. And that is the big question looming. Will Israel launch an all-out ground assault like it did in the 2014 war? Now, back then, seven years ago, Israel launched that ground offensive against Hamas's tunnels, tunnels that led from Gaza into Israel, posed a serious threat to Israeli communities. In the last seven years, Israel's ability to counter those tunnels has really improved. New technology, a huge barrier all the way around Gaza. So Israel may feel less need this time to send in ground troops. Now, conditions for civilians on both sides are horrible. But let's be honest, they are worse for civilians inside Gaza. This is one of the most densely packed places on Earth. Two million people with nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. We have been hearing from parents inside Gaza who are terrified for their children. Israeli warplanes are overhead at all hours of the day. There are explosions all around them, and they just don't know what to do to keep their children safe. Should they stay at home? Should they go to a relative's house? The reality is they could get unlucky either way. At least 31 children have been killed in Gaza so far, and that number is likely to rise. Now, conditions also terrible for Israeli families all across the south of the country. They have been spending nights in bomb shelters, holding their children close, and hoping that Israel's Iron Dome missile defense system will keep them safe from these rockets being fired indiscriminately by Hamas towards Israeli cities. The votes are in. Elise Stefanik is the new House Republican Conference Chair. I believe that voters determine the leader of the Republican Party, and President Trump is the leader that they look to. Uh, I support President Trump. Uh, voters support President Trump. He is an important voice in our Republican Party, and we look forward to working with him. NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Garrett Haig live for us from the Russell Rotunda. Uh, Garrett, how did this vote go down, and what else did Stefanik say today? Allison, this was the expected ending after more than a week of drama yeah. here about the future of Liz Cheney and the House Republican Conference. Stefanik won what was a secret ballot vote pretty handily by more than 100 votes over her closest competitor, uh, conservative challenger Chip Roy from Texas. And afterwards, she and the other Republican leadership were preaching unity, sort of. Here's what she had to say. Liz Cheney is a part of this conference. Adam Kinzinger is a part of this conference. Uh, they were elected and sent here by the people in their district. They are part of this Republican conference. We are unified in working with President Trump. My job representing our Republican members, the vast majority, we will look forward to working with President Trump. Yes. Do you talk to Liz Cheney since the events of this week? I have not. So you get about half credit there for Elise Stefanik. It is true that the majority of House Republicans are unified on this idea of working with former President Trump. Uh, you heard it from their, her there time and time again. That is why House Republican leadership wanted to make this change. But the Liz Cheney's, the Adam Kinzinger's of the world, still on the outs, but still in the party and probably still perfectly willing to speak up against the former president.
Yeah, Garrett, House lawmakers reached a bipartisan deal today on a January 6th commission. Uh, what will that commission do? And do you have any idea who might be on it? This is a big breakthrough. This has been stalled for months, and now we're going to yeah. see a commission of 10 people picked by a combination of the various House and Senate leaders. We don't know who they'll be, but we know that they have to be uh, law enforcement professionals, and they can't be current or, or, yeah, they cannot be current officials, government officials, uh, in any capacity. They'll have subpoena power, and they've got a deadline. They'll be expected to produce a report on the January 6th insurrection by the end of this year. That bill could be voted on in the House as early as Wednesday of next Next week. Garrett, I'm hearing Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy is saying that he never signed off on that deal. What's his particular issue here? What's going on? McCarthy doesn't like the scope of this. He has wanted for some time okay. to see more things included in this commission rather than mm -hmm. less. Here's a little bit of what he told reporters when he found out about this bipartisan deal earlier today. You want to make sure that the scope, that you can look at all that, what came up before and what came up after. So that's very concerning to me. You want to make sure that the ability that there's no findings prior, then why do you have the commission make it political? Now, the language in the legislation is a little bit amorphous. It talks about other things that might have influenced January 6th. If you take a liberal definition of what influence means, that might allow McCarthy to get to the scope he's looking for. But you'll have an even number of Republican and Democratic commissioners involved in this. So uh, they'll have an opportunity, I think, to look at what they want to look at. All right, Garrett, thanks so much. I know it's been a busy week on Capitol Hill. I hope you get some time to enjoy the weekend. No kidding. Thank you. President Biden out and about with no mask on today, his first full day on the job mask free. NBC News White House correspondent Monica Alba joins me now. Uh, Monica, I'm hearing that the president made an unannounced appearance outside the West Wing entrance today, which, as we know, anytime the president goes somewhere and it's not announced, that sparks a mad rush of reporters. I imagine it made for a bit of a stressful day. But they asked him about his first full day without a mask. What did he say? That's right, Allison. The president was taking photos with an outgoing senior staffer and her family. And of course, everybody then noticed that uh, an unusual visitor walking around the grounds and of course came out to try to speak with him. And it was exactly that issue that is the most prominent visually now that we know the president doesn't have to wear a mask anymore, given that CDC guidance. A reporter did ask him what it felt like for his first full day without a face covering and whether he was enjoying that. And he responded with a very emphatic yes, like I think many of us can attest, even though this is still taking some getting used to. But this was a president who didn't have anything open or public on his schedule today. He was doing everything behind the scenes instead. But it's one of those rare moments where when you're covering the White House, it's fair game, whatever's going on anywhere on the grounds. And there are these moments where suddenly the president walks out of the West Wing and there's a camera and a reporter there and you're able to have an interaction <laughs> like the one we just played. <laughs> He's on the move, and so you are, too. Uh, Monica, I know the president met this afternoon with six DACA recipients today uh, who work in health care, education, agriculture. What did he say about getting legislation for the Dreamers through Congress? And he invited these six DACA recipients to the Oval Office, Allison. And that's notable because he did that when he was vice president as well all those years ago. This is an issue that the White House tells us the president wants to be sure that he's making it a priority and he wants to do that symbolically by having a meeting like the one he did today, even though it was behind closed doors and there wasn't any press coverage for it. So now the White House is saying we know all of the main things he's working on in terms of infrastructure, jobs, the American Families Plan, but on a parallel track, He's really urging lawmakers to try to take up what the House has already passed in terms of immigration bills, urging this to happen in the Senate, even though it faces a very steep uphill climb. But today's meeting was an indication of how the White House wants to be sure this is really front and center and on people's radar because they would like to see a path to citizenship and more protections for those so-called dreamers who are, of course, young people who were brought to this country by undocumented immigrants and through no fault of their own have lived here with status that they would like to see cemented as more, given all that they contribute as well to our society, Allison. All right, Monica Alba with the latest from the White House this Friday. Thank you.
It's time for the bottom line, our daily look at what's going on in the business world and beyond. No better place to start than the markets ending the week on a high note. The Dow closing up 360 points today. Uh, stocks, particularly tech stocks, bouncing back for a second day in a row. So let's bring in our favorite Friday financial guest, Investopedia editor in chief, Caleb Silver. Caleb, the markets have been absolutely all over the place this week, and tech in particular has taken a beating, though it is bouncing back as we head into the weekend. So uh, what's up with stocks right now? Very, very choppy, Allison. I think there's a lot of nerves out there in the market, but also the NASDAQ, which is where those big tech stocks basically hang out, that's been down four weeks in a row as investors have rotated into the value plays, into the recovery stocks, and into utilities, which are a safer part of the stock market. But still, every time the market gets a little choppy and falls a little bit, there seem to be buyers ready to buy in and buy the dip. And that's what we saw this week. We're still down for the month of May, but really high, uh, doing much better for the whole year. And obviously, from 13 months ago, we're doing great. Yeah, it was a little bit of an attractive dip, though. I kind of glanced and saw if there was anything I felt like buying. Uh, Caleb, we've got to talk inflation. It's the hot topic this week. We got the May Consumer Sentiment Index today that measures how consumers feel about the economy right now. It dropped to 82.8. Economists were expecting it to pick up to 90.1. The bottom line here, consumers are worried about inflation. So let's talk about their concerns uh, and what else we've seen on inflation this week. Sure. It's the big I word. It's on everybody's mind because it's here. It's front and center. Consumer prices, Allison, for the month of April are up 4.2% from a year ago. Producer prices, those are those input costs that your manufacturers use to then make product and sell to you. That was up 6.2%. But remember this, we are coming off of such a low base from last year where prices fell off the cliff in April, May, and June of last year as we went into the pandemic and the lockdown. Now they're rising back up. Demand is back. You're seeing the surge higher in prices across the boards from lumber to bacon to chicken wings to coffee you name it it's getting more expensive gasoline too consumers feel that so they don't care if the federal reserve says it's transitory only going to be here a few months they're feeling it now and that may be what would be what is behind their reticence to spend given the michigan sentiment survey yeah caleb i love it you literally mentioned all of my favorite things chicken wings bacon coffee i mean what else do you need uh l- listen uh, we got to talk about what's coming up next week because i know we got a lot more going on uh, what's what's on deck I know, a busy week ahead i think yeah, we have sort of the tail end of earnings season, but next season, uh, next week is key yep. because we're going to hear from Walmart, we're going to hear from Home Depot, we're going to hear from Lowe's, big box retailers that sell a lot of things that we use yeah. to spruce up our homes or build new homes. We want to hear what they have to say because if there's inflation and consumers are reticent to spend, they'll feel it and they'll tell us that. So I'm looking forward to hearing from them. Also, the housing market key reports next week, existing home sales, mortgage applications, and, and new homes. And so we want to see our people still is attracted to the red hot housing market. It has been the star of the show for the past year as those mortgage rates have been very, very low. Home buying has been incredible. Home prices have been appreciating. Is that going to continue? And then the oil and gas inventory report for the week. Normally, we don't care anything about this, but given what went on with the Colonial Pipeline and the the hack attack there that stopped the flow of gasoline to the southeast, we're going to be paying a lot of attention to it. We want to see if supplies are back. And as you know, President Biden uh, is doing is waiving what we call the Jones Act, which is our term of the week this week. I was going to say, we're not letting you go without the term of the week. We didn't forget about it. The Jones Act. What's that? And why should our viewers care about it? Right. The Jones Act, viewers may know it as the Maritime or the Merchant Marine Act. This is 101 years old. This requires a good ship between U.S. ports to be transported on ships built and owned and operated by U.S. citizens or permanent residents. U.S. goods on U.S. ships. That's the deal. It was enacted in 1920 during World War I, and the emergency waivers are granted here and there when we need emergency fuel supplies. President Biden has deemed that we need emergency gasoline supplies so he can deal with the shortage. We can deal with the shortage we're seeing in the southeast due to the colonial pipeline hack. So he's waived that act. It's the second time that's happened in the last few years, but it's 101 years old. So when you waive an act like the Jones Act, it's a pretty big deal for historians. That's why it's our term of the week. And we're going to be keeping an eye on oil and gas inventories because of it. All right. I know you will, Caleb. We love having you on Fridays. We'll see you next week. Have a good one. See you next week. Taxes are due on Monday. If you forgot, you're welcome. But is our current tax code putting black Americans at a disadvantage? NBC News Now correspondent Simone Boyce takes a look. As part of his $1.9 trillion stimulus bill, President Biden expanded the child tax credit, increasing it from $2,000 to $3,000 per child for 2021. But some Democratic critics of the tax credit argue it unfairly advantages two-parent households. 
the way the proposal has been structured, which is the way we've always structured proposals actually, is to disadvantage single parents. It's really a single parent penalty. It's true. Biden's tax credit would affect single parents differently. Single parents can't receive the tax credit if they earn more than $75,000 a year, but two-parent households qualify for the credit up until they earn $150,000 a year. According to the Kids Count data center, black children are more likely to be in a single-parent household than their white counterparts. This disparate impact on single-family households is just the latest and one of the many ways U.S. tax law unequally impacts black and white Americans. When black Americans and white Americans engage in the same activity, like getting married or buying a home, the tax law subsidizes how white Americans engage in the activity, but disadvantage how black Americans engage in the exact same activity. Dorothy Brown is a professor of tax law at Emory University. Her book, The Whiteness of Wealth, looks at the ways that tax policy tend to benefit white Americans more than black Americans. Take the joint tax return, for instance. That's where instead of filing separately, a married couple files one tax return together. For couples where only one spouse works or makes substantially more income, the joint return provides a lower marginal tax rate on the shared income. But that doesn't help two-income households as much. In effect, couples where both spouses work, it is as if one spouse's income is stacked on top of the other so that they're subject to a higher marginal tax rate than if they had remained single. Even in 1948, when the joint return became law, an overwhelming percentage of white wives were stay at home, like 80%. However, that wasn't the case for black wives. Black women, ever since we came to this country enslaved, have worked outside of our homes. But once slavery was abolished and we now have wages that black wives can receive, we know they're more likely to work than their white peers. As a result, black married couples are more likely to not get a tax cut when they get married and for decades were more likely to pay higher taxes because husbands and wives in black marriages earn roughly equal amounts. There are married black couples that get a marriage bonus. They're just small as a percentage. There's nothing in the code that says black married couples pay more. It's just how the code operates. But the marriage bonus is not the only thing in U.S. tax law that disproportionately benefits white Americans. If I sell my home at a game and I'm married, up to half a million dollars of that game, I can receive tax free. If I'm single, I can receive $250,000 of it tax free. If, however, I sell my home at a loss, I don't get any tax benefit from that loss. More white Americans are homeowners than black Americans, so you would expect this provision to benefit more white homeowners simply because of that. But my response is that's not even the worst problem. The worst problem is who is eligible for homeownership wealth and lots of it, such that the half a million dollars is going to matter. And it's white homeowners. Why? Because the housing market is racialized and the greatest gain is found in homes that most white Americans live in. Why is it that there's a mortgage interest deduction, but not a deduction for rent? We know homeowners are overwhelmingly white, but black Americans are more likely to be renters, but no tax break for rent. Now, there are some ways in which low-income folks benefit from our tax code, both in terms of marginal rates and tax credits. But is this discrepancy really a matter of race, or is it more about class inequality? Here's one take. I'll talk about race, and someone will say, no, Dorothy, it's class. And then I show them the data for example, at the marriage bonus penalty, right? The joint return, it shows black Americans at all income levels are more likely to be in two way earner households. It really isn't class, it's race. Harper's Bazaar is one of the top fashion magazines in the world. Now it's leading the industry in diversity, too. Harper's new editor-in-chief, Samira Nasser, is the first woman of color at the helm, and she's determined to make the magazine more inclusive. Today's show co-host Chanel Jones has her story. 
Harper's Bazaar, known for being first in fashion with a history spanning over 154 years, is being recognized for another first, the magazine's first black editor-in-chief, Samira Nasser. Welcome to Harper's Bazaar. Oh, so it's all on this floor? Yes. So this is the edit side. Okay. I grew up in the suburbs of Montreal, and for as long as I can remember, I've always been in love with fashion magazines. What was it about it for you that you loved? The fantasy, the escape, the possibility, the dream. I grew up in a very loving community, but no one really looked like me. My father's Lebanese, my mother's from Trinidad. They were both immigrants, and my parents were divorced when I was very young. And so magazines were just a place where I could be transported to another world. That world would soon know her name, but her path to the top was far from typical. You went to NYU. Yes. What did you think you were going to do? I did my undergraduate degree in philosophy, and I thought, I'm going to go into biomedical ethics. Yes, I said it. I wanted to go into biomedical ethics. ethics. Yeah. Okay. But her journey took a turn. An internship at Mirabella Magazine opened her eyes to a new world. Did you have a moment where you were enlightened and you thought, you know what, this is where I belong? I remember as an intern being asked to be on set at Mirabella, but to just see how everyone on set worked to create these images and, and the creative energy, it was exhilarating and thrilling and something that I wanted to lean into and follow. And that's exactly what she did. Landing jobs at American Vogue, Allure, Elle, In Style, Vanity Fair, and then a phone call that changed her life. When did you know for sure that you'd be the next editor-in-chief? We were in lockdown. I was in Prospect Park with my son and I got, a, I got the call. My son was like, Mama, get off the phone. And I was like, I need a minute. The journey in the fashion industry probably wasn't necessarily easy. No. Did you ever feel like a fish out of water? Did you ever feel out of place? Or did All you always? the time. Yes. I love this industry. This industry has afforded me a beautiful life, and I've traveled, and I've grown, and I've learned so much. But at the same time, there weren't a lot of people who looked like me when I was coming up. Now determined to use her experience and create space for others. We are at the intersection of high fashion and culture, but still there's so many stories to be told and there's, there's a level of humanity that we can bring to those stories. And to be able to create a space and to share our platform and our pages with individuals for them to tell their full stories and to be seen in the pages, much like I wanted to be seen when I was little, kind of goes back to that ideal. Have you ever thought about the girl who is like you all these years later, who she picks up your magazine and it's her escape, it's her time to dream? You can make me cry. <laughs> I do. I think about not just little girls, I think about little boys. I think about people. I think about individuals. And I hope they can lean into their dreams. You did that. Thank you. That's all I got. Have a great day, everyone. <laughs> I hope I can inspire people to dream big. President Biden's been open about his own struggles with stuttering, helping millions of other Americans who share the speech disorder. To wrap up National Stuttering Awareness Week, NBC News senior national correspondent Kate Snow talked with two teens about their challenges. For seventh grader Jolie Deichman, stuttering is a daily reality. When I talk to my friends um, in school, we know I stutter. Um, they really pay patience with me. For Oliver Barres, starting high school last fall meant introducing his reality to hundreds of new classmates. I found elementary school like um, really challenging, and um, it was pretty hard. Because um, most uh, kids, they um, didn't really um, understand. I just feel that um, school for me now, I feel because I've gotten a lot better because I'm a lot more 
confident. They're just two of the more than three million Americans who stutter, a speaking disorder that can take several forms and is very often misunderstood. Do you think people understand what stuttering is? Most people just don't think that like we're nervous. Not a lot of people really kind of know how it feels to like um, stutter. It's something you're born with, right? It's not because you're nervous. So it's something you can't control. The person who stutters knows exactly what they want to say. Um, they will just say it differently. It doesn't mean that they're not prepared for class or they're not prepared for the job interview. It's just a different way of speaking. Stuttering drew new attention when Joe Biden was campaigning for president. He's been open about his lifelong stutter and released a campaign video with a teenage supporter who shared the condition. We're always going to go, go be rooting for you and that we're here for you. He later invited Braden Harrington to speak at the Democratic convention. I'm just a regular kid, and in a short amount of time, Joe Biden made me more confident about something that's bothered me my whole life. For people who stutter, the president's story brought welcome visibility. Once I, I found out that like so many other people stuttered, including Joe Biden, it just made me feel like comforted in a way that like I'm not alone. Advocates hope the president's personal experience will lead to policy changes in schools and the workplace. Diversity, equity, and inclusion also includes including the person who stutters. Short says reading proficiency tests for kids shouldn't require oral responses, and she's pushing for expanded coverage under health insurance plans. Big insurance carriers see stuttering as something that has an end expiration date. They may give you 10 sessions, that's it. Stuttering does not have a cure. Just because you do 10 sessions in first grade, it doesn't mean that you don't need 10 more. What Oliver and Jolie want most is understanding. One of my biggest pet peeves is when people um, finish my sentences um, because it, it makes me feel less than because I I know what I'm gonna say. And like, I understand that people are trying to help me, but it's not really helping me. It's kind of making it worse. It's probably annoying. Yeah, it's really aggravating. The more accurately we can represent what stuttering is and isn't in public, I think it will make people feel more comfortable to actually stutter in public. They can feel free to be themselves. Hey, NBC News viewers, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here and click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights, and digital exclusives. Thanks for watching.